Welcome to Body Kindness. I'm Rebecca Scritchfield, creator of the Body Kindness Philosophy book and audiobook. I'm here to help you create a better life by reinventing health from the body oppressive, shaming, and you'll never be enough type of mindset to positive and joyful ways that you can spiral up your energy, mood, and your well being at any size, shape, or weight, and as you are right now. Get started for free at bodykindnessbook.com slash start. That's the sound of me smashing a stack of scales in front of some friends. And I have to say that breaking up with the scale and all the other ways I was judging, monitoring, and measuring my worth was absolutely pivotal in my life. Creating the body kindness philosophy and letting myself be a human being again helped me become a better mom, a better clinician, and a happier and healthier person. I believe we all have a right to decide how we want to care for ourselves, and I think we all need support in figuring out what that looks like. You don't have to do this alone. There's a whole community of like-minded people who are fed up with diets, who are embracing intuitive eating, and who are completely redefining their lives from body shame to body kindness. You are not broken. Our culture is. Find your inner caregiver and create a better life with body kindness. The really big surprise to me in in writing this was, first of all, how much they wanted to talk. Like, they really wanted to talk. And about a lot of stuff that they, you know, are supposedly reluctant to talk about, like their feelings. But they also, they weren't like totally blank slates that the culture was inscribing on. Just like girls, you know, they could see that they were in this cultural, you know, environment that was sometimes giving them really damaging messages that were hurtful to them and then hurtful to their romantic partners. And sometimes they had absorbed them. Sometimes they were acting them out. Sometimes they were really struggling with them and trying to fight against them. So there was real, I I just felt like starting the conversation with them and they would say all the time, you know, this was cathartic. This was therapeutic. This, you know, changed the way I look at things. You know, it was really amazing to be able to talk about this because we rarely, rarely give, you know, allow boys to explore their interior lives and give them permission and space to really have those discussions about sex, about emotional intimacy, and about gender. That was Peggy Orenstein. She's the New York Times bestselling author of Girls and Sex, Cinderella, My Daughter, Waiting for Daisy, Flux, and Schoolgirls. A contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine, she's been published in the Washington Post, Slate, New York Times, The Atlantic, and The New Yorker, among other publications, and has contributed commentary to NPR's All Things Considered. She lives in Northern California with her husband and daughter, and today we're talking about Peggy's latest, Boys and Sex, Young Men on Hookups, Love, Porn, Consent, and Navigating the New Masculinity. I know you're going to get some real helpful insight out of our conversation Anything related to your own past experiences with your body and who told you what to think about your body and sex and intimacy and pleasure and all that, as well as if you're a parent who's, or someone who cares about teens and um, you know hookup culture, you're going to get insight about what is really going on right now and also really powerful ways that you can help um, communicate with boys, which also ends up helping girls. And I just think that reading this book and hearing this conversation is um, going to be challenging in some ways, but also is going to give a path forward that's going to be really helpful for everybody's collective well-being. Speaking of that path forward, Peggy let us know that her website has lots of free resources for parents. So please take a look at the show notes. I'm going to be linking to her website and her free resources, as well as my previous interview with Peggy on girls and sex and my whole podcast series around sexual health. So you get lots of helpful information uh, for your body kindness practice. And also remember body kindness is about relationships with others as well. Communication is at the center of our relationships. And I'm so grateful to Peggy for her time and talking with me and for writing this very important book. Enjoy the show. Peggy, welcome to Body Kindness. Thank you so much for having me. 
I'm so grateful for your time today and that you're here. You are literally currently out on tour. You're with your latest book, Boys and Sex, Young Men on Hookups, Love, Porn, Consent, and Navigating the New Masculinity. Yep. That's me. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've been following, you've had some national TV appearances. You had an article in the New York Times, and I've just kind of been following you around on, on Facebook too. And it seems like, and you're obviously doing events and speaking, which is all great. That means that, you know, your, your hard work is getting out there. And it seems like you're getting a mix of positive, um, feedback and conversations, one that would, um, you know, hope, you know, to move our culture forward that we could be having. But then there's, there's also, maybe it's just an inevitable, (laughs) you know, negative pushback or trolls, should we say? So I don't know if you mind just diving right in since you're in it. Can you share like, how are people receiving this book? What are the bright spots and what are the kind of like, really in 2020, this is the pushback we're getting kind of BS. I, I'm just personally curious if we could start there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of interesting because, you know, it is a new thing having books out in this era compared to, I mean, it just, it just keeps, just keeps getting more. So girls and sex actually came out before the 2016 election. So it's, it's a different environment to put a work that is, you know, fundamentally feminist out in. But that said, I would say 90% of the email I get is super positive. And, and it's been really interesting this round because, you know, I, it's not since I've been writing about girls and women for 25 years, this is the first time I've shifted over to writing about boys. I don't typically get a ton of email from men. Mm-hmm. And so I'm getting a lot more um, feedback from men and from, from boys, for sure, and boys who are writing me to say that they feel seen, that they've like heard something or read the Atlantic piece or, you know, and some bumped into something that I was doing and that it, it really validated them. And even like last night at an event, I had a division one athlete come up to me and really sincerely engage me in a conversation about how he can interrupt locker room culture. And, and really like, he was really an interesting guy because he was saying, you know, how he, he wanted to know like where the lines of personal responsibility were, when you step in, how you step in. Not that I have answers to these things. He was just asking me the questions. And he said, the thing is, is that, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to be part of this team. And when you're out on the playing field together, you have to be working as a unit and you have to be trusting one another. And if you start, you know, sowing division actively in that way, that might affect that. You know, it was, it was just a really interesting conversation talking about the dynamics that keep boys silent. So I get a lot of stuff like that. I also get a lot that's been interesting from um, adult men who feel like parent age guys who feel seen. And that's been really interesting, too. And of course, women. And then, you know, there's inevitably, I mean, if you write as a woman, even if you're not covering something as, you know, hot buttony as sex or gender, you're just going to get all kinds of crap. It's just the world that we live in. And it can sometimes be a little bit like being, you know, it it can feel like, you know, a a little tiny, well, it's a micro, you know, like a little tiny assault, or it can, so once in a while, it cracks me up, you know, once in a while, it's just so ridiculous. When somebody calls me a communist, or, you know, something like that, I just think, really, you took the time to look up my email Mm -hmm. in order to do this? Yeah. Well, and interesting that like I've certain, there's a certain tone that can hide behind an email or hide behind, you know, a social media, which is really more of this. Are they really trying to engage in conversation? They're just trying to be like a trolling, you know, butthead for lack of a better word. Right. And that can almost be easy to let it slide, you know? Yeah. Although, you know, it's still like ugly stuff. But one thing that's, that, I've re- that I've been thinking a lot about, because this has come up a couple of times on the radio and it comes up always when I write New York Times pieces, is there's a certain cohort of adult, I really haven't talked about this, it's mm-hmm. interesting, mm-hmm. Um, a, a certain cohort of like adult men mm-hmm. who will say, well, you know, your sample is very, I, I talked to a hundred guys, that mm-hmm. that was, that you, how can you possibly make a generalization from that sample? Or, mm-hmm. you know, I would like to see exactly what your research is and what your methods are. And, mm-hmm. and I realized here, you know, at first I thought like, 
do I, you know, I would sort of like engage with them and go, well, you know, journalism, I'm sure you know, as you probably read in the paper when like you read an article about that where the reporter has talked to like 20 people and is making a story about that. That's kind of what journalists do. Mm -hmm. And then we undergird with, you know, like Mm -hmm. I was like, take it seriously. And then I thought, oh, wait, no. Yeah. What's going on here is another, another version of not all men. What's Mm. going on here is the desire to, and I think it's an instructive example because it's something that women in particular can get pulled into, that what this is about is a conversation that is avoiding engaging in the ideas and avoiding engaging in the reality of the work that I'm doing um, under the guise of some kind of rationality when in fact it's just deflection and a way to derail the conversation. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It's like detouring the whole discussion kind of and putting in this analytical kind of show me the data lens. And it's like, okay, well you show me the data this that this isn't happening. A, right. B, as a journalist, your book is in, you know, it, it it's qualitative because it's based on interviews, but then it, it also cites statistics and research where it supports what you're finding anyway, which is absolutely, you know, an appropriate evidence-based method of right. getting support for what you're talking about. With 40 pages of evidence. But I just don't <laughs> think that those guys would say to Nicholas Kristof oh. about his book that's out right now, mm-hmm. well, you only talk to this many people about how they hold out hope <laughs> um, in America. So exactly why do you think you can draw conclusions about that? It doesn't matter. Like everything yeah. that you just said is true yeah. and it's beside the point of what they're really doing there. It's a, it's a r- rhetorical manipulation. Yeah. And I realized I'm not going to do it anymore. Yeah. I'm just not going to, I'm just not going to do that anymore. Yeah. So that's interesting. I mean, I think as a woman, you know, to think about the ways that, and it, well, see, I'm about to say not all men, but that, that's yeah. that whole, like not all men concept yeah. of the way that it, of course, like any idiot knows it's not all men <laughs> though. You'd be stupid to think that. I'm not stupid, <laughs> but it's a way to deflect and derail the conversation. So you don't have to actually deal with the ideas. You don't have to actually deal with reality. You mm-hmm. can just shut it right down. Yeah. Well, we don't have time for that. We're going to deal with the reality. No, No, but it's just, I I do think it's a really interesting, I don't know. It just made me really curious about it as a, I mean, that's how I get curious about stuff. Stuff like that happens and I start thinking about it and I think, well, what is that phenomenon about? What what does that tell us? What does that tell us larger ideas about, you know, about gender and gender dynamics and who gets to speak and what entitlement looks like and all these different things? It's just it fascinates me. Yeah. So now I'm like totally, I'm like waiting for somebody to do that again so I can have this conversation. <laughs> so you're ready. Well, I mean, it, it at least says that, you know, as we have come to know that it doesn't matter, you know, like you have education and expertise and all this credibility. And yet, you know, men are asking you and questioning to prove all it. this credibility to prove exactly it. to justify yep. it like you have a different and i think a lot about field. that too i think i mean especially because the kinds of pieces that i write and the kinds of books that i write and the and the platforms that i've been lucky enough to be able to build around you know the times and the atlantic and having these big books that those give me a kind of cre- a, a shield of credibility or 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 a scaffolding mm-hmm. of credibility maybe that allow me to sort of be able to not be as affected by that sort of manipulation or the ways that the culture tries to delegitimize women, people of color, other marginalized groups when they speak. And there's a lot of times when I feel like if I, if I had just a little less of what, you know, what I've managed to amass in terms of that kind of capital, I don't know that I would be able to, you know, say the kinds of things that I say. I don't know that I'd be able to do the kinds of things that I do. I mean, it's really, I, I, I have amassed an awful lot of capital and privilege to be able mm-hmm. to have conversations that are pretty tempo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, there's almost like, um, there's almost like a me too element to it. Right. So because if, if you still run into these barriers with all this privilege. What are the stories that aren't being told? Who else exactly. is being silenced, right? If it's exactly. this hard for you, then we're all kind of, you know, screwed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I don't, I, I don't want to say that. That's sad. But, <laughs> but no, I really do think about that. I really mm-hmm. do think all the time about, you know, the, you know that, that I somehow managed to thread the needle and get this voice in the public and that it's unusual and that um, there's been times when I've thought, wow, if I didn't have that at this moment, 
I'd walk away. I, mm-hmm. I'd be, I would be shut down by this person or by this institution mm-hmm. or by this whatever, um, because I wouldn't believe that I had the right to be saying what I say. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope that, you know, I, I, I can imagine how exhausting it is to be touring and doing interviews and everything like that. So when you need your batteries recharged, maybe think about that all the people that you are helping that you hear about and then the ones you know that you don't hear about that you are using your privilege for good and as a as a reader of the book it helped me tremendously i mean i've got girls but there was still so much help whether it's you know my role as a clinician because i work with families including boys with body image concerns and i can see some intersections there and then of course just raising girls i'm i am still scared because they're on the receiving end of some important topics you talk about in this book. And so it's, the work is absolutely necessary and crucial. And it, you know, I, one of the things I love is how you are hearing from boys directly, because as, as much as I know, we want to talk to parents and people who care about teenage boys and college students. And also I have this, almost this hope that's like, and the boys are going to save themselves, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, well, like they, they might not wait to. for us. <laughs> they, they really want to, Rebecca. I mean, yeah. they, first of all, I mean, the, the really big um, surprise to me in, in writing this was, first of all, how much they wanted to talk. Mm-hmm. Like they really wanted to talk mm-hmm. and about a lot of stuff that they, you know, are supposedly reluctant to talk about like their feelings but they also they weren't like like totally blank slates that the culture Mm -hmm. was inscribing on just like girls you know they Mm -hmm. could see that they were in this cultural you know environment that was sometimes giving them really damaging messages that were hurtful to them and then hurtful to their romantic partners and Mm -hmm. sometimes they had absorbed them sometimes they were acting them out sometimes they were really struggling with them trying to fight against them so um there was real I, I just felt like starting the conversation with them and they would say all the time, you know, this was cathartic, this was therapeutic, this, you know, changed the way I look at things. You know, it was really amazing to be able to talk about this because we rarely, rarely give, you know, allow boys to explore their interior lives and give them permission and space to really have those discussions mm-hmm. about sex, about emotional intimacy and about gender. Yeah. You know, I'm so glad you just said that because one of the things that I wrote down and starred when I was reading is when you were doing one of the interviews and I didn't write down the interview name, but he basically said, F it, I'm just going to tell you. And he went in this story and that was what you had said in the text. Like rarely are boys given the permission to speak from the heart. And that yeah. just really stuck with me is like, wow, to not even be given the space. Because that really is like your bottom line up front, like from wanting and needing to write this book is like, hey, parents aren't talking to their sons about sex, intimacy, yep. and consent. And that's really harmful to yeah. them. And so you engaged in these interviews. Like, um, give us some highlights, how many boys, right. how long you interviewed, and kind of what was the what was the mission? You know, besides right. I wrote and Girls and Sex, I had to do the other one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there was that. Yeah. And you know, this idea that we don't have the we just don't have the luxury of silence. And mm-hmm. and I, I like that you underlined that line about mm-hmm. the heart because I really ended up feeling after doing these two books, when I kind of look at them side by side, that girls and sex is very much about how girls were have been disconnected from their bodies and their desires and the impact of that on them and, you know, by association, their romantic partners and boys and sex. A lot of it is about how boys are disconnected from their hearts and how that disconnection from emotion and emotional vulnerability not only harms them, but, you know, then goes on to harm their partners in ways big and small. So, you know, one of the issues in in the book was that, so I talked to these boys, a hundred boys across country, all kind of, like the girls, they were either college bound high schoolers, so they were in college about ages 16 to 21 and different ethnicities, different sexual orientations, different gender identities from all over the place to have this discussion about sex and gender and intimacy um, because nobody else was doing it. And I sort of started with talking about masculinity and I would ask guys what the ideal guy was mm-hmm. and even though, I mean, these were guys who, you know, thought girls deserve their place in the classroom and in leadership and on the playing field and in professional opportunities. They had, you know, platonic female friends, gay friends. So a lot had changed. Mm-hmm. But that ideal man question, right down the line, they would answer like they were channeling 1955. 
You know, it was mm. like dominance, aggression, wealth, sexual conquest. And the big one was emotional suppression. Yeah. And that idea of like, uh, that all they got was happiness and anger. And so there was this whole bucket of emotions, you know, sadness, grief, but, uh, frustration. I don't know, you know, all these things that just went into this one place for them right away. And they would talk about how they learned to build a wall inside of them mm -hmm. that was between the world and their sort of real feelings. And they would say things like, I trained myself not to feel, or mm -hmm. I taught myself not to cry. So one of the boys um, was talking about how his, his parents had gotten divorced, and but he had trained himself not to cry. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to. So he streamed three Holocaust movies back to back. You know, mm -hmm. that worked. Mm -hmm. But when we cut boys off, from, you know, so much of the heart of the book ended up being about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So it's about the taboo of vulnerability, about rejecting it, about denying it, about embracing it, about capitulating to it, about, you know, feeling betrayed by it, all these things. But it was so much the heart of the book. And when we cut boys off from that emotional vulner vulnerability, not only, you know, is that fundamental to our humanity, but it's essential to human relationships. Brene Brown calls it vulnerability, the secret sauce that holds relationships together. Mm -hmm. So when we do that, we, we, uh, make, we reduce their capacity for having the kind of relationships with friends, with romantic partners, with future spouses that we want them to have. And again, you know, that radiates outward and, and harms their partners as well. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm seeing you get across too, is that without the vulnerability, then they really can't have intimacy. Right. Right. Exactly and so we could bitch about the issues with porn, which we know that there are issues or hookup culture. And we could be like, that's a problem. That's a problem. But in the end, if we can't train them, if we're not giving them the space to feel and permission to have all their feelings and to be vulnerable, how could they possibly have intimacy if they can't be vulnerable? Right. So all of those things, you know, porn, media, all these other things, what they do is reinforce that dynamic. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they, and, and there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of nuanced ways that we could talk about that and a lot of things about those that, but the overarching thing is that they're reinforcing male disconnection, you know, sex as, as status seeking or, or conquest culture. They're reinforcing male sexual entitlement, female se sexual submission and availability. And, and one thing I thought a lot about in terms of when boys do express, confide or express emotion, they tend to do it either in a girlfriend, with a girlfriend or a female friend or their mom. Mm -hmm. And I thought a lot about that because, you know, with, for moms particularly, I think for moms of boys, it's really sweet to feel that you're that person for your son and to, you know, to see him be vulnerable and to be able to be there for him in that way. The thing is, though, if we process boys' emotions for them rather than teaching them to process them themselves, we're playing into that idea that women's role is to do emotional labor for men. Mm -hmm. And I think that while that can feel very rewarding when it's your son, you know, a lot of us women know that as you get older and when you engage in adult relationships, not so much rewarding. Right. And I also think that maybe there is something about the father figure giving permission for the vulnerability and guiding this, I don't know, kind of like values driven guide to intimacy. Right. And because there's so much to learn about what is normal. Right. And I just feel like on both sides, like, I'll be honest, I'm, you know, I mean, my oldest is only seven, but still, I mean, you name it, I'm dreading it. I'm dreading puberty. No. I'm dreading the first kiss. I'm dreading, you know, you know, and of course I think a lot of it is just, you know, my baby's grown up and also yeah. wanting to protect people from pain, but I know that's not real either, but there is, there's going to be roles, right. But that I think that if the father figure can't be vulnerable enough to say, hey, I'm scared. I don't want to mess this up, but I, kn I know I need to love enough to try to do the next right thing. Then it's it's not the mom's fault. It's just not enough because yeah. there's something special that can come from that. Yeah, and you're right. Um, fathers are the chiefs of the gender police. They're really dictating those terms. And and you know you see it when boys are as young as four 
when if put alone in a room with Mm -hmm. a bunch of toys, they won't, even if they think their father's not going to find out, they won't choose the toy dishes, which aren't even really a gendered thing Mm -hmm. because they don't want their dad to know. Mm -hmm. Um, And you see it with the boys that I spoke with, they would talk about things. I mean, you know, yeah, there were guys who said, you know, my dad used to tell me to man up or be, don't be a little bitch or whatever that Mm -hmm. happened. But more of the guys would say things like, my dad wasn't sexist. My dad was not homophobic. Mm -hmm. I did not learn that whole toxic masculinity thing from Mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. But I did learn the stunted side of masculinity because he was more the sigh and walk away kind of guy than the kind of guy who would talk to you about what was going on. And boys expressed a lot of yearning to have those conversations with their father or father figure. And so, and I think it's hard because, you know, men didn't grow up that way. Nobody fathered them that way. So that's a leap that they have to take. And it can feel, you know, it can feel scary and it can feel confusing. And I think the main thing to know for them is that they don't have to be perfect. You know, you don't have to be, you don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to know all the questions. You don't have to get it right the first time. And you don't even have to have the perfect relationship in your own life Mm. to be able to drop some wisdom on your son. One of the things boys would say they really wanted to know about, uh, they wanted to know about sex. They wanted to know about the emotional aspects. The inti- they wanted to know about emotional intimacy from their dads. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to know about their dad's regrets. So, you know, that's a really hopeful place where we can sort of make some change and, and encourage change in boys' lives. Yeah. And I think helping parents understand like what is normal social emotional development anyway, as scared as we are, right? And you would make I'd written down some notes where you talked about intimacy for kids. Like I numbered them for some reason. Maybe it was just my note taking yeah. abilities, but it was like desire to be close and it's like mutual, like a mutual desire that there was consent involved in communication and you know, to want to feel good and how that is good and that to want to connect to others. And um, I made a note about biology, like feeling good in your body and brain, like those were all like good the good natural normal desires and feelings and they're part of intimacy. Mm-hmm. Don't use intimacy as like a placeholder for having sex or whatever. Right, right. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways that we can talk about connection and that, you know, with little boys in particular, helping them name emotions, you know, saying so that they don't, so that we do expand their range so that they're not just thinking anger so that you say, wow, you know, you seem really sad. Or even when they do express that, you know, that kind of volatility to try to see what's underneath that and help them name that. Because what happens is they lose the ability to name feelings. Mm -hmm. And a lot of adult men don't have the ability to name their feelings because they've just been so, so restricted. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that I loved about reading the book too, is I was like, oh my gosh, she's like done the investigations for me. You know, as a, as a parent, you're like, what's the latest app? I don't TikTok, you know, or what, you know, you feel really behind the times. And so when doing these interviews, one of, it just was really surprising to me to read like what they even classified as sex was just different than what I remember. And I'm scratching my head a little bit, but I think it was like they didn't consider blowjob sex or something or Oh yeah, that's in both <laughs> books. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. And and I mean that's partly on us, right? Because mm-hmm. we have really emphasized the idea and I do it too. You emphasize mm-hmm. the idea that sex equals, you know, penis penis vagina intercourse. Mm-hmm. And so that but that but when we when we make that into the sort of line in the sand between childhood and adulthood or, mm-hmm. or, you know, childhood and maturity. And, and we define sexually active as being so narrow mm-hmm. as, as intercourse that allows a whole lot of other acts such as oral sex to be named as not sex mm-hmm. and therefore possibly not subject to the same rules around um, respect and consent and mutuality that we might be getting a little bit better at discussing around um, intercourse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was really fascinating to me just to kind of see, read about hookup culture and that, you know, the pressures that exist and the, the connections that I could make was that, so there's definitely an influence of porn and nobody's saying, oh, all porn needs to go away, that that's not it at all. But it's like, when you look at kind of like who is making the porn, who is it made for, what are they communicating? And when, again, when the parents aren't talking to boys about sex, how much 
in your interviews was porn used as an educational tool. And yeah. because of how porn as a structure has problems, how that is failing the boys yet again and driving hook of a culture. So what can you paint right. for us? Well, so, yeah, I want to, you know, as you were sort of indicating, I want to be really clear. Obviously, curiosity about sex is normal. Mm -hmm. Masturbation, great, really Mm -hmm. important way of understanding your, your, you know, your bodies and your likes. And porn is not porn is not porn. There's queer porn. There's feminist porn. There's ethical porn. That tends to be behind a paywall. Mm. And what has changed in addition to, you know, Internet and smartphones is that in 2007, so this is relevant for any boy who went through puberty from 2007 onward. Mm -hmm. Pornhub came online and dropped the paywall. So that meant that you could see anything that, you know, you could imagine and a lot that nobody really wants to imagine Mm -hmm. right at your fingertips. And you wrote about it and I'm not going to say it, but it's in the book is all I'm going to (laughs) say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's important stuff um, Mm -hmm. because I really tried to put it out there in a way that was um, exploratory and, and explained rather Mm -hmm. than soapboxed um, about porn. Because, you know, again, you're an adult, do whatever you want, God bless. But mm-hmm. um, we're talking about kids here and absent um, and, and, and the kind of porn that they tend to access over and over reinforces this idea that sex is something that men do to a partner rather than with a partner, that female pleasure is a um, performance mm-hmm. um, for, for male satisfaction. You know, bodies obviously are distorted. Obviously, there's not. Um, intimacy or sensuality or playfulness or messiness or you know consent a lot of times so it's really important that we get in there and talk to boys about what's real and what's not real part of that by the way means um and this is especially i think relevant for for adult women Mm -hmm. um less so for men that if you haven't ever looked at pornhub you kind of need to because if you have some like 70s notion of porn in your head Mm -hmm. you are way off Oh you, gosh, that's my assignment. I haven't looked yet. I'm scared. Well, because you said you put in boobies and you'll in Google and you'll see porn. Like it's that accessible. Well, you will put it. Yes, you will. But you also see like the kind of thing that we used to consider porn. You know, like when we were in high school or something. That's mainstream media now, right? Mm, that stuff is yeah. all migrated downwards. Mm-hmm. So, and that's the thing too that we, you know we talk a lot about porn, and we do need to talk about porn because you know kids do bring it into the bedroom with them. Absolutely, um, but. Mainstream media reinforces those values as well. And, you know, one boy said to me, I think music has a big impact on how guys treat girls. And and he said, you know, you're driving around with your guys all day and you're hearing these lyrics that are, I don't know if you want me to say them. Yeah, I, go but, for it. Okay. It's explicit. So, you know, <laughs> like what he said was you just hear fuck that bitch and quitter mm-hmm. four, five, six, ten times a day. Mm-hmm. You know, of course it affects your mindset. Mm-hmm. But I think to me the most poignant quote that a boy told me about porn was he said uh you know i feel like the whole process of of uh the whole feeling of innocence of going into a sexual relationship and of being able to explore sex without preconceived ideas of what it is which should be a natural organic process has just been fucked for our generation Mm -hmm. by porn Mm -hmm. oh it's so sad you know because it is in the way that you presented it, it did, it did, it showed that there are, there are harmful elements of it where it basically puts this fake narrative out for, you know, talk about boys trying to be a man, right? It's the right. rule book, you know, this is what you're supposed to do. And if at all you fall short, then that's going to, you know, harm your masculinity. And, um, you know, the reality of it is, is we're humans with these parts and we, you know, we're not always going to get it up every time or, right. you know, what, what, you know, is, um, what it takes to get, you know, the partner to have an orgasm or like all that stuff is kind of, it's told in a story where at their ages, it's like, okay, so is this reality? And, and in some of the ways you were talking about it, it kind of, um, in really intimidated them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would they would talk about sometimes feeling like 
almost a fear mm-hmm. you know, of, <laughs> of the performance that was expected for them as guys. And then again, that would be reinforced by hookup culture. So in hookup culture, you know, the sex is not really about the sex in a way, because mm-hmm. if you're drunk and you don't know somebody very well, how good is that really going to be? Right. You know, and there's very little communication, but it's very much about the story you're going to tell your friends. And part mm-hmm. of the story, so so boys, I, I've said before, um, in Girls and Sex, I talked a lot about how uh, the inequity in the orgasm gap and the inequity in hookup culture and how unlikely it was that um, boys would, you know, they, they, they care in a relationship, but in a hookup, really not so much. And but they, but but what was interesting to me was that they actually did care about female satisfaction. They just didn't define it the way that we might. They mm. defined it exclusively through um, their through stamina for them, in, you know, male endurance during intercourse, and to a lesser extent, penis size. That was what equaled female satisfaction. So because they were they were worried about what the story that the girls mm. would tell their friends. So you know, one guy said to me that he got into the habit of looking at the clock before he began intercourse so that he could think about, you know, make sure that he like lasted long enough, you know, a reasonable amount of time. And he said, it wasn't even really about her pleasure. It was about his own pride and wanting to know, you know, be sure that when she went back and told her friends about what happened, that she wouldn't be disappointed. So, Mm -hmm. and he said, it turned sex into, he said, it turned sex into a task for him, Mm -hmm. you know, one that he enjoyed to a certain extent, but a task nonetheless, and something that took, you know, that made him so that he was not in the moment. And I thought that was a really interesting thing to say, because we think a lot about what is enjoyable or not enjoyable in those dynamics for girls. But I was surprised to hear how often guys would kind of say, yeah, you know, it's, it, it's not really about good sex. It's not really about even getting off all the time. It's about what you're going to say to your boys. Mm-hmm. Like status. Yeah, it's about status seeking. And so, yeah, it's about the, it's, as one guy said to me, you know, uh, the, the girl is a means for you to get off, you know, a means for you to get off and, and brag to your boys. That's what you learn from, from um, your friends. And, and in saying this again, boy, you know, boys are not blank slates. They were, they were telling me these things as sort of, because they were struggling with them. The boy who was telling me about the clock, you know, that was something he didn't like that. That wasn't something he was happy about. Um, and he was sort of trying to, you know, think about what other pathways to being there were. And one of the, in one of the scenes, it's one of my favorites in the book. Um, mm-hmm. I'm skyping with a boy who named Wyatt, who um, had, he called himself a feminist fuck boy because mm-hmm. he he had taught workshops on consent for guys, and he was, uh, you know, knew all the knew all the right language. He knew what to say, but that didn't stop him from taking advantage of the skewed way that the hookup culture at his school advantaged guys allowed them to see their partners as disposable and allowed a certain amount of emotional man- manipulation. So he was, you know, still pl- playing into that. And he was questioning that when we talked. And then when we talked again, he had gotten to a new place with it and he was sort of not engaged in that stuff anymore. And while we were talking, this other boy texted in and he was a boy who'd had a bad experience in the hookup culture. He, he really was a person who wanted connection, wanted affection, wanted that relationship. And he was looking at schools where he'd gotten into college and he was in Southern California and he would stick to me going, you know, WTF, it's an orgy down here. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to go to bone town and worry about the emotional (laughs) connection later? I know. I know. For anybody who thought that they might not talk to me, like, (laughs) bluntly, not a problem. I want Um, your job in some weird way. I don't know. Oh God. (laughs) I'll tell you something. When you're sitting at a freshman pregame party on a Saturday night. (laughs) Did you have a red solo cup with your name on it? (laughs) I don't drink the solo cups, but it, let's just say it's a whole lot of awkward. Um, but, uh, anyway, Anyway. so, so so Nate was texting me and he was saying, you know, do I go to bone town? Do I make an emotional connection or do I just skip that part? And so I just looked at that and I, and I said to Wyatt, Hey, let me read you this text that I just got from the senior in high school. Tell me what you think. And they ended up having this incredible conversation through me where Wyatt was saying, you know, if, if this isn't who you are, man, it's going to kill you. I know lots of people who don't engage in that stuff. There's other ways to be. There's other ways to meet people, et cetera, et cetera. You can you know, disrupt the script. And Nate wrote, you know, thanks. That's just what I needed to hear. And then he sent me a little heart emoji and so cute. And, uh, and I really sat with that and thought, wow. Truthfully, I'm a total stranger to these guys, mm-hmm. and they never met one another. 
But because of the weird, you know, serendipity of both of them being part of this book project, they got to have this conversation that I really think made a difference to Nate moving forward. And what would it be like? If they could have those conversations with the adults in their lives, what would it be like Mm -hmm. if they could have those kinds of conversations with one another? Mm. And that's what I really hope that this book would generate. Yeah. I was was tracking 100% with that as I was like, okay, so you were this momentary conduit just because of where you happen to be in that time and space. And But that power of community and connection and this open, honest, peer-driven support, it's kind of like culture jamming the narrative that says, you know, this is your only resource, you know, yeah, cheap porn basically. And it, it right. gives, it gives a different outlet. And, um, because yeah, it's not culture can take a really, really, really long time to change. But the point of it is, is that we know that we can't continue on with the way that things are right now and being silent about it because it, it harms everybody's well being And it just creates more of you know, more of the same sex and love and relationship situations that we, um, that we're dealing with today. And, and not that it needs to be perfect, but what we're also talking about there is issues that are very relevant today, such as consent. And can you talk for a couple of minutes about this sort of, there were some stories where there was confusion around, I don't know if I got consent or not. And there were some examples mm-hmm. of how, of where you can get consent or have conversation. Even um, the, it seemed to be like from the LGBTQIA culture, like how, like, you know, like, what are you into? Like such a simple right. way of engaging in a conversation that we could look yeah. to leadership for that. So what would you like yeah, to that share? Was, that was a, they were, that was a really great model. I, you know, when I would talk to um, gay boys in particular, they they were a real model of how to negotiate and navigate consent and the parameters of the sexual experience. So mm-hmm. one of the guys, you know, that I talked to said, I don't really understand straight boys resistance to having conversations around consent because like when we talk about consent, it means we're having sex. You know, that's great, <laughs> you know? And they had to develop that language because it is not assumed mm-hmm. what is going to happen or who is going to do what with whom and how. So you, they had to learn how to talk about it. Um, they didn't have that same presumptive script that we have. And so Dan Savage, who's a syndicated sex columnist in Seattle, says that, and he's gay, and he says the four, he calls it the four magic words that gay men use at the start of a um, sexual encounter, which is, what are you into? And you're right, it's the most lovely open-ended question, because so often when we do cons- discuss consent with kids, we act like it's a set of pre-prescribed questions usually that the guy is asking the girl that she is saying yes or no to Mm -hmm. and that is not what we mean by that what we want and what we hope for is this more creative idea of you know developing an experience and and discussing an experience that's going to work for both of you but i did think when i was talking to dan about this he's a gay guy Mm -hmm. he has sex with men I think if you had a heterosexual boy and girl, a young person together, maybe mm-hmm. even an older person, and a guy said that, the girl's response might well be, I have no earthly idea. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> and that's the dynamic. That's the other book. That's Girls and Sex. Mm-hmm. But it was really the way those two fit together and mm-hmm. that kind of perfect storm of socialization into kind of silence and, uh, you know, male moving the the ball down the playing field and girl actually being the playing field um, that that we have in this culture right now. And again, you know, because of the moment that we're in, I, I really think the reason that a book like this could break through and and be about what could create a positive, mutually gratifying, personally fulfilling relationship, regardless of whether that relationship is going to last five minutes or 50 years mm-hmm. for, for boys and men, um, is because of the Me Too movement. Mm-hmm. And because the, you know, of the of the revelations of sexual misconduct being so, you know, broad and across every sector of society, it became clear that, you know, something something needs to happen. Um, and we, we need to reduce sexual violence. But it also created this kind of little crack in the edifice and this opportunity that I could like sneak in with to say, yeah, and the way to do that, the best way to do that is to start having these conversations with boys about sex, about intimacy, about gender in ways that are not just demonizing and negative, but that also talk about the do's and the shoulds and the coulds and 
help them surface and see some of those dynamics that are socialized into them that are, you know, systemic so that they can resist them too and have the kind of relationships that they deserve to have and be the men that, you know, we know they can be. Yeah, a hundred percent. And as parents, it's, it's going to be a lot of doing those uncomfortable things. I remember when I first interviewed you for girls and sex, and I was talking about, you know, how like my daughters were curious about all their vagina parts and, um, you know, we talked about the clitoris and you're like, well, talk to them about, you know, it's just like your elbow. It's for making good feelings. And I was like, oh, that's great. And, you know, so they're now five and seven and we have a book on body parts and, you know, sex. They were actually books that you've recommended for age appropriate ways. And it's, it was interesting because I thought of that when I was reading and one of your interviews was talking about Googling different images, but he said, I couldn't handle vaginas. Like they were alien like, and I was like, Well, I'm not expecting that sort of discomfort to go away. You can see those memes of like 90 vaginas and they really do look very, very different. But what is that tied to, right? The lack of sex ed in schools and, but it's not just the school's job, right? But we know, again, it's like if, if, if it's something that you don't even want to look at, you know, that can create some problems with, well, what do I do to help bring pleasure, right? Because that's part of the job, you know, and the intimacy is like kind of hopefully mutual pleasure. Are you getting pleasure out of pleasing somebody else? So it's, it it can start that early, right? The knowing your own parts and knowing that it's okay to get and, and seek pleasure, you know, when you're talking about if, even if you could ask, what are you into? You know, a lot of females would coil the, like, I don't know, or it doesn't matter because of the, that lack of permission to masturbate and it to be okay, permission to explore and figure out your, what you want and it to be okay. And whether it, it's probably got to have to come from a lot of resources, but the absolute reality of it is right now is it's still very much a hush subject. And that means right. boys and girls, they're on their own. Which is, you know, so ironic considering that we um, steep boys and girls in a sexualized culture that is just awash in transactional commodified sex and images of male sexual entitlement and, you know, female um, sexual submission. And, and yet we say nothing, nothing about what a, you know, really healthy, positive sexual relationship can and should look like. It's, it's, it's a really bizarre disconnect. And yes, schools are hamstrung in so many ways from being able to have the discussion, but parents really don't tend to have it either. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what, what boys would say was that they were told, don't get a girl pregnant, don't (laughs) get a disease, don't let a girl accuse you of assault (laughs) and, you know, and, and respect women. And, Mm -hmm. and they were all, they also, when parents told me to respect women, but they couldn't really tell you what that meant. meant. (laughs) And, so, you know, one guy said, well, the truth is, you know, telling, telling a boy to respect women is like telling him not to run over any little old ladies and then handing him the car keys. Like, <laughs> yeah, you don't think you're going to run over any little old ladies, but guess what? You still don't know how to drive. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. That's a perfect metaphor. It's so true. And it's just, I think that that's, it goes back to how we started, right? This is going to be uncomfortable because it's part of the human experience. If we were raised very open and the culture was different, it wouldn't be so uncomfortable. But as parents and people who care for, you know, teenagers, college age students, you know, and again, even starting younger with knowing the body parts, it's, we can't afford to say nothing because it is, that's, it's, it just leaves people alone and isolated. And you have a lot of detail um, that we didn't get to today that really goes into specifics around harms and their individual stories, which is so special. It's a beautiful way to learn. You talk about hard topics that we don't really want to face, but through the stories, there's almost this intimate connection. I could envision the room or the conversations and how you describe them. And I really saw, like you were saying, boys who wanted to talk who needed somebody to listen and who wanted to know that it was going to be okay. And you just did such a fabulous job with the book. Oh, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Rebecca. 
So um, once again, the book is called Boys and Sex, Young Men on Hookups, Love, Porn, Consent, and Navigating the New Masculinity. Um, I'll make sure folks have the link to your website so they can come see you on tour and get the book, audiobook, ebook, all the different forms. Um, and is there any other way you'd like folks to be in touch with you or, you know, make sure that they can get your goodness? The website is great, you know, social media, whatever. But I want to add one more thing, which sure. is that along with, you know, my own book, on my website, um, there's a resources button and there's just tons of resources for parents, things that you can give to your kids across the age span, Mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff um, on all the topics we've talked about and more so that you can really help have that conversation and give you some more tools. Mm, Thank you so much. I'll be sure to share that in the link in the show notes as well. Thank you. And that's our show. The podcast is made possible with support from listeners. Please donate to help offset production costs at gofundme.com slash body kindness. And please rate and review the show when you have a moment. It really matters. Let's keep the conversations going on Facebook. Search body kindness and request to join the group for body kindness readers and listeners. Have a question for us to answer on a future episode? Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash question. Body Kindness books and audiobooks are available wherever books are sold. To request a signed print copy, visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order. For other questions about this podcast, please email info at bodykindnessbook.com.